हेलो एवरीवन गुड इवनिंग कैन यू ऑल हियर मी प्लीज शो अ थम्स अप हेलो सो वेलकम ऑल टू द क्लिनिकल थर्सडेज दिस इज एन इनिशिएटिव बाय आस आर डॉक्टरियल्स टू ब्रिंग यू क्लोजर टू द वर्ड्स वेर यू एक्चुअली सी द पेशेंट्स दैट यू रीड अबाउट यू नो नाउ द एग्जाम इज ऑल अबाउट योर नॉलेज योर कॉन्सेप्ट एंड योर अबिलिटी टू अप्लाई दोज इन द क्लिनिकल सिनारियोज सो इन दीज क्लिनिकल थर्सडेज वी आर हियर टू गेट यू closer look you know at how the patient presents to us in the opd how we actually examine the patient and what is the management that is given to the patient the management includes the investigations that we do as well as the actual treatment that the patient does and also sometimes we are able to show you the follow up of how the patient responds to the treatment you know it is this gratification of seeing the patient respond that makes you really happy in your clinics so in today's topic in dermatology here we'll be discussing about pemphigus what is pemphigus can you just give me a maybe two three word description if you know this disease i need one of you to give me a very small you know two three word answer of whether you know what pemphigus is have you ever heard about it or maybe ever read about it no problem even if you don't know much about it by the end of this class today i'm very sure you will know what it is see before i proceed i'll tell you how we'll go about today i am going to show you an actual patient who visited the clinic who was admitted who was diagnosed treated and also the follow up of that patient so what we will do today is just see how a case of pemphigus comes to us and how we make the diagnosis it is not a road learning video it is not just an mcq based thing it is an approach to a patient clinically and yes obviously nothing will go without reading the mcqs that come with it mcqs are the most important part after you treat the patient yes so now i had a 26 year old female patient named radha who presented to me with complaints of painful oral ulcers for 6 months and for the last 3 months she had blisters on her body with painful skin lesions which were not healing you know a patient has these normal oral ulcers or blisters on the skin they generally heal but the patient becomes alarmed when you have had them for a long time and they are not healing plus the fact that they are painful so this is a 26 year old lady see when she came to me in the opd this is what she had on the skin if you can see uh, that there are multiple red raw erosions covered with a brownish crust and on the back as you can see the red oozy erosions that this patient has very flu few fluid filled blisters actually by the time the photos were taken the blisters uh, were not visible they had all ruptured so here what you see is actually the erosions which are covered with the crusting can you see this is how the patient presented now when i did the oral mucosal examination there were oral ulcers in the mucosa as you can see in the image here and there was some amount of crusting on the lips now when a patient comes to you with uh, when a patient comes to you with maybe fluid filled lesions on the body or painful erosions on the body with oral ulcers there are multiple differentials that can come to your mind it can be a drug eruption 
okay then it can be uh, the immunobullous disorder that we are talking about it can be a paraneoplastic phenomena so there are multiple things that this patient can be now drug eruption how do you rule out drug eruption will have skin lesions it will have mucosal, mucosal lesions but there will be most importantly a history of drug intake in this patient there was no history of drug intake Plus, a drug eruption, the patient will have sudden onset of the lesions, like oral and skin lesions will all come within a matter of two to three days. In this patient, the lesions were present for six months duration, the oral lesions. So that also is a factor that goes against the drug eruptions. So whenever you have a patient or you have a question in your exam where you have to differentiate an immunobullous disorder from a drug eruption, look for these two factors. Number one, the history of drug intake, if there is that. And sometimes the questions may not actually give you a clear history of drug intake. It may just say that the patient who is suffering from generalized seizure disorder on treatment presented to you with this. So generalized seizure disorder, that's a hint that is given in the exam that the patient has been started on anti-epileptics. So one or the other way, the exam question will tell you that the patient is taking a drug. So this is one point towards a drug induced eruption. A second point is the duration of the complaint. So duration of the complaint will be like from the drug intake to the onset of skin lesions will be around one week and these skin lesions will spread all over the body in just one to two days. So it will be a very short duration of the disease. So this is how you will differentiate an immunobullous disorder from a drug eruption. Now, the only differential that I have with me is a immunobullous disorder here because at your level and even at my level, nothing else looks like this. So in order to know whether it is a immunobullous disorder, which type, whether it is the pemphigus type, that is the intraepidermal or it is the subepidermal type, that is the pemphigoid. Here again, the history comes into focus. In the history, the patient is saying that she's had oral ulcers, which are painful, non-healing since six months. And she has had flaccid bullae on the skin with painful erosion since three months. So flaccid bullae, which are not really visible even on examination, like you see this here, you don't really see any bullae. They're all so flaccid that they ruptured and they're covered with this kind of a crusting. So this is a clinical picture, which tells you that the patient is suffering from pemphigus. Had it been pemphigoid, the patient would have complained of tense bullae, which, you know, increase in size for five to seven days. So these are very tense bullae. Plus, they are associated with intense pruritus. They may be present on a red base. Now, nothing of this sort we get in the history. So when you have this big bracket of immunobullous disorders, you take the history to know whether these are flaccid bullae or they are tense bullae. In the flaccid bullae, we know we are dealing with pemphigus. Painful erosions, we know we are dealing with pemphigus. So now this is the patient with me. I have to now see if she is actually a patient of pemphigus. So what do I do? I do some bedside test. In bedside test, the two tests that I will be doing are the Nikolsky test and the Buller spread sign. What is happening in the Nikolsky test here? In the Nikolsky test, I don't have a writing instrument right now, so I won't be able to mark on the picture, but I hope you can make out of what is written here. So see, this is the Nikolsky sign here. In the Nikolsky sign, what you do is, with your thumb, you put a So now this patient came to me in order to further see if she has pemphigus. I will do these two bedside tests. In the first test that I do, that is the Nikolsky sign, on this patient there is a bulla, there is an erosion here. So I take the thumb, I will do a tangential pressure on the skin just adjacent to the bulla. So when I do a tangential rubbing of the skin, the skin there is weak due to the autoantibodies. When I rub it, it will peel off. So this is what is Nikolsky sign. Peeling of skin on putting tangential pressure. 
this we generally do near the existing lesions because that is where there is a higher chance of this test coming positive. It is positive in patients suffering from pemphigus type of a disease. So in the second picture here, see the second picture, you see that the erosion has formed, the skin has peeled here. So this is a marker that the patient is suffering from an intraepidermal disorder where the skin is weak and the epidermis will peel off when you put a pressure. So this is the Nikolsky sign that we have elicited. Then we come next to the Bulla spread sign. In Bulla spread sign, what is it that you are testing? Again, you are testing that this is a bulla which is visible clinically. There may be a weakening of skin around the bulla also. So that is what you have to assess. So in this patient, on the bulla here, I will mark the margins, the circumference of the bulla with a pen. So I have marked the margins as you can see in the picture here. From the other side, I will put a pressure with my thumb. So when I put a pressure with my thumb on this bulla, the weak skin will also come along and the bulla will increase in size. It will spread because the adjacent skin is weak. You keep putting pressure, that weak skin will also get included in the bulla. So this is the bulla spread sign. The name itself is telling you that on putting pressure, the bulla is increasing. It is spreading. And how do you know this? You see that the mark of the pen which was initially at the margin has now come up. So the bulla has increased. These are the two common clinical tests that we do at the bedside. Rather we do in the OPD itself to see if the disease is active because they are also markers of disease activity. If the patient has an active disease, it's full of autoantibodies, then there are higher chances of these two tests coming out positive. Now, there is a variant of the Bulla spread sign which is called as the Asmo Hansen sign. In Asmo Hansen sign, the patients generally have very small bullae, so there is no space to press them from the side. In those patients, what we do? We mark the bulla, we put pressure from the top. So when we put pressure from the top, the bulla increases on all sides. This is called as the Asbo Hansen sign. It is just a variation of the bulla spread sign. In bulla spread, you put pressure from the side. In Asbo Hansen, you put pressure from the top. Okay, so after I've done these two clinical tests, I have seen that they are positive. Now, I want to further do some investigations. I have admitted the patient. On admitting the patient, there are some investigations which I want to do. A bedside test that we can do is the Zang smear. In the Zang smear, what do you do? In the Zang smear, I will take the patient's vesicle. I will not take it, like I'll take the arm of the patient on which there may be a vesicle. With a blade, I will cut the edges of the vesicle like this. So once I've cut, I will remove the roof. Now here is the erosion. With the blunt end of the blade, I will scrap the erosion. You understand? This is a vesicle like this. It shows this is the vesicle. With a blade here, I will cut the vesicle, remove the roof, and the base which is here, which is the erosion, I will scrap it. After I scrap it, I will put it on a slide, do a gene sustaining, and then see it under the microscope. This is called as the Zank test, and the smear that we make is the Zank smear. So this is actually a type of a cytology smear. Why? Because I'm studying the cells in the slide. So this is a cytology smear. Once I see it under the microscope, what do I see? I see these beautiful round cells here. So these are the beautiful round cells which I see. And in these round cells are what are called as the acantholytic cells. See, when the epidermal cells separate from each other, there is simple physics coming into play. They will assume a small size, a round shape in order to get the least surface tension. So all these squams which have separated from each other, they will all become small round cells with a large nucleus. These are called as the acantholytic cells, also called as zank cells. Okay, so this is the zank smear that I've done. Again, I've seen acantholytic cells here. Now, what do I do? In order to further confirm the diagnosis, 
I will do two more investigations actually. The confirmatory tests are these which I will do now. The bedside test gave me a hint. Zang smear further gave me a hint. But to confirm the diagnosis, I need to do these two investigations. I need to pick up the intact vesicle, send it for histopath examination. And from the skin around the vesicle, which is the very lesional skin, I will pick up another part of the skin, send it for DIF. So please always remember, you never know if the INI CT exam will ask you this question. The skin biopsy in the pemphigus or for that matter any immunobullous disorder, the skin biopsy goes from the lesion, that is the vesicle. Bullas are generally very big, you cannot take out intact bullas, you will have to do a big biopsy. So you take intact vesicles for the histopath examination and you take the normal perilesional skin for the DRF. So once I have done these investigations, see what I will get on the histopath. In the histopath, very beautiful finding here that you see in the first image is a split that is just above the basement membrane. So this empty white space that you see just above the stratum basale, this is the split. And since it is just above the basement uh, basal layer, it is called as a supra basal split. So what you see here is a supra basal split and some small small cells floating in the cavity here these are all acantholytic cells even this question has been asked what is this finding there were cells floating in the cavity this was asked in the AIMS exam about five six years back so these are acantholytic cells which are floating in the cavity and where are these derived from this question has also been asked these cells in this disorder with the supra basal cleft what is the layer above the basal layer it is the stratum spinosum so when the cleft is in that layer they obviously come from the stratum spinosum so the source of acantholytic cells here is ss that is stratum spinosum two questions here the cleft or the split is supra basal there are acantholytic cells floating they are derived from the stratum spinosum and in the adjacent image, what do you see? You see this beautiful row of tombstone appearance. The basal cells are attached to the basement membrane, but they are separate from each other. So this is the row of tombstone appearance that you see here. And above this, you see the empty space, which is the suprabasal cleft. In fact, a question on these two findings was asked in the INICT May 23 exam. Okay? So, this is the May 23 exam question that you are seeing right now where the histopath shows suprabasal acantholysis and there is a row of tombstone appearance. These two findings are diagnostic. And when we do the DIF, in the DIF we see this intraepidermal IgG deposition in a fishnet pattern. So, what you see here on the DIF is the fish net pattern of IgG deposition. This is seen in pemphigus again. Now, all this while I am talking to you about pemphigus. I am telling you I have done the bedside test, I have done the Zang smear, I have done the biopsy, the DIF, but I haven't really told you what type of pemphigus am I dealing with. Can any of you in the chat here tell me that what type of pemphigus is this? I haven't told you the diagnosis till now. We are just talking about pemphigus and pemphigus. But amongst the different types of pemphigus, having seen this clinical presentation, can any of you tell me what type of pemphigus is it? I am waiting for you all to answer. Tell me what type of pemphigus are we dealing with? Anybody here? Ashutosh Rahul? Yes, very good, very good. 
Very correct. You've just written the short form that was mistakenly there on one slide. Please tell me the full form here. Or is it the correct answer that you are remembering? Tell me the full form. What are you thinking? What type of pemphigus is it? PV can also mean pemphigus vegetans. Yes. Very good. So here, having seen that the patient has oral ulcers with skin lesions, the patient has a suprabasal acantholysis with row of tombstone appearance. These are the two features which take you towards a diagnosis of pemphigus vulgaris. Presence of oral ulcers and the histopath. Because the clinical test, the DIF, they are the same across all types of pemphigus. It is only the presence or absence of mucosal involvement and the histopath which gives you the diagnosis as to what type of pemphigus we are dealing with. Good. So now this is my patient of pemphigus vulgaris. See how nicely she has responded. This is after 8 months of treatment. Mind you, this is not a disease which gives us immediate results. It takes a very long time to control the activity of this disease and also to bring about a healing of the lesions you know healing of the lesions in itself takes so much time these erosions look so you know just like a normal wound but they take months to heal in fact i had one patient who told me madam till now all my wounds have healed in a matter of few days what disease do i have here the wounds are not healing what is wrong with me so that is the thing here. When you look at it, it looks like a simple burn. It looks like a simple erosion. But it takes months, maybe sometimes even two to three, three years in some of our patients to heal. So this is a patient who has responded to eight months of treatment. I treated her with DCP therapy. What is DCP therapy? This is dexamethasone cyclophosphamide pulse therapy. Here, what do we do? We give a supra-pharmacological dose of the steroid. You know, you have to understand what a pulse means. A pulse therapy. So when you give a pulse therapy, how does a pulse go? A pulse goes like this and then it comes down. Then again it goes up, it comes down. So when it goes up, you have to give that much medicine. So you have to give a supra-pharmacological dose of the medicine. That is the term here, the key word here. A very high dose over a very short period of time and then a break again the very high dose over a very short period of time so it is seen that you when you give these supra pharmacological doses in such a short span of time you know so now you have to give zor ka jhatka zor se diya so you know that you have to give suppressive dena hai, steroid dena hai. so when you give the steroid you give the immunosuppressive instead of giving it daily you give it over a period of three days at a very high dose you try to kill as many uh, you know autoimmune cells the b cells as much as is possible so it has been seen that you when you use this pulse therapy in pemphigus overall you give a lesser amount of steroid then you bring about a lesser risk of side effects and the results are of course you know much better so what are the three advantages of pulse therapy? You give lesser dose of the drug, that's a cumulative dose. So over one month, if I were to give daily steroids, I will give much lesser dose if I give it, you know, even in a higher doses over three days. So lesser amount of steroids, lesser risk of side effects and better results. So this is the advantage of giving pulse therapy. And with the steroids, we combine a steroid sparing agent. You must have read this across your MCQ textbooks. We give cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, sometimes methotrexate. So what are these? These are all steroid sparing drugs. So here I have combined with cyclophosphamide. Why can I give cyclophosphamide in this patient? Because she was married early. She had three kids. Uh, she did not want to plan a family. So I can give cyclophosphamide in these patients. 
because we don't give them to younger patients who are yet to plan a family. Sometimes it can cause, uh, you know, risk of mutations in the germ cells and there may be a risk of a malignancy or other things in the future. So generally in younger age, in reproductive women, in children, we avoid cyclophosphamide. Right? Since this patient had her family completed and she had a severe disease, decided to give her cyclophosphamide. Now when you give the pulse therapy, you give consecutive three days of injection dexamethasone 100 mg per day. On the second day, you give cyclophosphamide 500 mg. When you give cyclophosphamide, what are the two things that you have to keep in mind? Can anyone here tell me what are the two precautions that you take in a patient who is taking cyclophosphamide? We have to take these precautions in these patients also because I am giving her a very high dose. I am giving her 500 mg of cyclophosphamide in one day. You see the oral dose that I give her, that's just about 50 mg twice daily, which is 100 mg. But when I am giving a pulse, I am giving her five times the dose on that day. So what is the precaution that I have to take when I give such a high dose of cyclophosphamide to a patient? Waiting for a response here. Tell me what is the most important side effect of cyclophosphamide that you have to keep in mind. And you have to take precautions against it. Can anyone tell me if I don't take this precaution, I'm doing, uh, I'm not doing right to the patient. I have to have to do these two things when I'm giving her such a high dose of cyclophosphamide. Anybody out there who can tell me this? Okay, I'll tell you, when you read this in pharmacology, you will read this in medicine, you will read this everywhere. Yes, I've got one answer. Good, 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 Ashutosh. It definitely has a side effect of causing hemorrhagic cystitis due to its acrolein metabolite. Okay, now how do you avoid this? Number one, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You hydrate the patient. You keep flushing them with water. <laughs> Not flushing means you keep giving them water, water, water so that there is very less accumulation of this acrolein metabolite in the bladder. And the second thing that you do is you give them mesna. This mesna will chelate with the acrolein, take it out of the bladder, thereby reducing the risk of hemorrhagic cystitis developing in this patient. So these are two, no, it's not nephrotoxic. Uh, there is a difference. Nephrotoxic would mean kidney toxicity. On the other hand, cyclophosphamide here is toxic to the bladder because here it causes hemorrhagic cystitis. So you hydrate the patient and you give them mesna. So these are two things that are done every time the cyclophosphamide is given. And this therapy of three days is given every month. So that three days in the month is one pulse. Then there is a break. You give another pulse. Some patients respond early, some patients have even taken up to 30 and 40 pulses without much benefit. So there are every type of patients out there, you have to taper the therapy, you have to monitor them, you have to do everything according to the results that you are getting. And when you are giving treatment to the patient, you have to monitor them for any adverse effects that they may be developing to the steroids or the cyclophosphamide. So this is the patient after eight months and we can slowly taper off her treatment. So this was the patient of Pemphigus which we have seen. Multiple MCQs are also hidden in the discussion here. I hope you've been able to catch them when you get such clinical pictures in the exam. Always look for flaccid bullae. So when it says flaccid bullae, it is only and only talking about Pemphigus. Now Pemphigus, just a few basics that you should know. This is an intraepidermal type of immunobullous disorder. When we talk about immunobullous disorders, we classify them into intraepidermal and subepidermal. I've already told you. So, pemphigus is the intraepidermal, where, as you can see in the image, the split is within the epidermis. The target of the autoantibodies here are the desmosomes, which are these green green structures that you see in the image here which join one keratinocyte to another keratinocyte. 
So these are the intercellular adhesions. If anything will damage the desmosomes, the cells will separate. That is what is happening here. And these desmosomes have some proteins which are called as desmoglenes. And everywhere you read the antigens, you read desmoglenes. Desmoglenes are nothing but a part of the structure of the desmosomes. And another question that was asked in the AIMS exam in 2017, it was the type of hypersensitivity that happens in packages. We have type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity. Can you tell me what type of hypersensitivity is type 2? Here, the autoantibodies will go to the target, bind to the antigen there and cause local damage. So this is a type 2 hypersensitivity disorder where the autoantibody antigen complexes are formed locally and they bring about the damage in that particular organ. So Pemphigus is a type 2 hypersensitivity disorder and damage to the desmosomes brings about acantholysis. Acantholysis means separation of cells. Okay, so these are a few basics. Now very importantly you should know the different types of Pemphigus. In the different types of Pemphigus, the most common type is Pemphigus vulgaris. So most common type is Pemphigus vulgaris. Vulgaris in itself means most common. So when you have a type of Pemphigus which is vulgaris, yes it is the most common type of Pemphigus. But there is a further subtype of Pemphigus vulgaris which is Pemphigus vegetans. Mind you, this is the rarest type of Pemphigus. This question has been asked in the AIMS exam. What is the rarest type of Pemphigus? It is Pemphigus vegetans. Then we come to Pemphigus foliaceus. In Pemphigus foliaceus, we have two further subtypes. Pemphigus erythematosus. Where do you read erythematosus? Can you tell me where you read the word erythematosus? Erythematosus we read in lupus erythematosus. So this is a type of Pemphigus which has features of Pemphigus and it has the photosensitivity from the ELE. So here the patient has bullous lesions as well as photosensitivity. This is Pemphigus erythematosus. Next subtype of Pemphigus foliaceus is Fogo selvagem, which is actually the endemic type of Pemphigus. Here it generally happens in the people who live in forest in Brazil or other parts of South America. There you have a fly, a black fly. When it bites, there is something in the saliva of that fly. When it goes into the body, it initiates a molecular mimicry response against desmoglene 1. So because of that mo molecular mimicry, autoantibodies form against the desmoglene 1 and the patient has a type of pemphigus foliaceus. So this is the endemic pemphigus. Then we have the drug-induced pemphigus. Drug-induced pemphigus, three drugs you have to remember, PCR, where P is for penicillin, most common drug associated with pemphigus, C is for captopril, R is rifampicin. So three drugs associated with pemphigus, penicillin, captopril and rifampicin. Then we have paraneoplastic pemphigus. Can you tell me what is the most common malignancy associated with paraneoplastic pemphigus? What is the most common malignancy associated with paraneoplastic pemphigus? This is also a previously asked question. The most common malignancy associated with uh, paraneoplastic pemphigus is the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the most common malignancy. Other than that, we have Castleman tumor, thymoma. So these are two other malignancies but most common is NHL. Then we have a very rare type that is the IgA pemphigus. I don't intend to teach you IgA pemphigus because it is generally not asked but there is a name to it. It is also called as the subcorneal pustular dermatosis and in some questions of pustular psoriasis in the options you have this word there subcorneal pustular dermatosis. Here, small pustule like, you know, blisters develop on the skin. So this is actually a type of pemphigus, which is called as IgA pemphigus. You should only remember to know that this is different from pustular psoriasis 
और बुलस इन बिटाइगो इट इज नॉट एन इन्फेक्शन इट इज नॉट अ पस्टुलर इन्फेक्शन इट इज अ टाइप ऑफ पेंट्रिटिस दैट्स द ओनली रीजन यू शुड नो इट नाउ a glimpse of the target antigens in pemphigus in pemphigus vulgaris there is involvement of both desmoglein 3 and 1 pemphigus fallacious is only desmoglein 1 paraneoplastic pemphigus we have the desmogleins we also have some other proteins like the plectins and the plaquins so envoplaquin periplaquin desmoplaquin these are all some other proteins which form the desmosome so you have desmogleins plus these plectins and plaquins involved in para neoplastic pemphigus then iga pemphigus is desmocolin 1 again just for the purpose of you know remembering against other options you should know that there is something like a desmocolin 1 which exists and it is the target in iga pemphigus so just a quick revision pemphigus vulgaris dsg 3 and 1 pemphigus fallacious dsg 1 and in iga pemphigus we have desmocolin 1 now comes a very important point here when you can't differentiate based on the uh, clinical test and the dif how do you differentiate between pemphigus vulgaris and pemphigus fallacious a very very important question here is that okay you've got flaccid bullet but how do you know which type of pemphigus it is in the flaccid bullet if the mucosa is involved pemphigus vulgaris if the mucosa is not involved it is pemphigus fallacious as simple as that flaccid bullet with oral ulcer vulgaris flaccid bullet no mucosal involvement fallacious okay now why does this happen this happens because Fallacious has only antibodies against desmoglein one, and this desmoglein one is present in the skin. It is not present in the mucosa. So when you have autoantibodies only in the skin, you will only have skin involvement. When it is not going to affect the mucosa, there will be no mucosal involvement. So that is because desmoglein one is present only in the skin, and in vulgaris we have both three and one. Desmoglein three is present in both skin and mucosa. so obviously the lesions will be there in the skin as well as in the mucosa you understand see the images here under pemphigus vulgaris we have red raw oozy erosions on the body as well as oral ulcer on the other hand in pemphigus fallacious there is just skin involvement there is no mucosa when you do a histopath how do you differentiate between these two how do you differentiate the level of the cleft is different in pemphigus vulgaris you get a suprabasal split while in pemphigus fallacious you get a subcorneal split again the reason is this that desmoglein 3 is more in the lower mucosa so when you are damaging the desmoglein 3 you are damaging the lower epidermis in the lower epidermis you get a suprabasal cleft on the other hand in pemphigus fallacious it is desmoglein 1 which is present more in the upper epidermis so the split will be in the upper layers that is the subcorneal layer okay so you get a suprabasal split in vulgaris and you get a subcorneal split in pemphigus fallacious in vulgaris i told you that the cells come from stratum spinosum so looking at the image of pemphigus fallacious looking at the subcorneal split Can you tell me what will be the source of these acantholytic cells in pemphigus fallacious? Waiting for this answer here. Please tell me what is the source of acantholytic cells in pemphigus fallacious? i say a subcorneal split so a subcorneal split will be just below the stratum corneum what is the layer just below the stratum corneum it is stratum granulosum so the source of the acantholytic cells in pemphigus fallacious is stratum granulosum and it is stratum spinosum in pemphigus vulgaris another finding that you see in tv is the row of tombstone appearance which i have shown you and these two findings were asked in the ini ct exam 
DIF in both is same, it is Fishnet IgG, so you cannot differentiate between vulgaris and fallacious based on DIF. In the treatment options, you can give steroids, which can be given orally at a very high dose, or 1 to 2 mg per kg per day, or it can be given in the form of pulse therapy. Then certain other steroid sparing drugs can be azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, and cyclophosphamide. Can you here also tell me one more indication of pulse therapy in dermatology? I am not talking about steroid pulse here. I am just talking about pulse therapy. Where else do you see pulse therapy in dermatology? A uh, little difficult question here, but we use the itraconazole pulse therapy in treatment of onychomycosis, that is stemia unguum. Itraconazole pulse therapy, where again you give very high dose over a very short period of time and then you repeat it the next month. Yes, not in every tenia, you give it in tenia unguum, which is the onychomycosis. There we give itraconazole pulse therapy. Very good answer, very nice. Then what is the biologic that you give here? There are multiple biologic, CD19, 20, tyrosine, tyranase, kinase inhibitors, then multiple other things that they are trying in Pempicus, but for the purpose of our exam, important to know the CD20 inhibitors. In the CD20 inhibitors, most commonly used is rituximab. In rituximab, now, actually, it is the first line treatment. If we see the European guidelines, the EADV guidelines, for treatment of pemphigus, the EADV guidelines tell us that rituximab is now the first line treatment provided the patient does not have any contraindications. Because in 90% of the patients that we give rituximab, there occurs a remission. That is an excellent result. Why will you wait to give the patient steroids for months, you give them pulse therapy and you know, just keep waiting for the remission to happen when? Rituximab being a safe drug, it has been tried in lymphomas, it has been tried in rheumatoid arthritis, in SLE, so everywhere it has been tried, found to be safe. You give this drug, beautiful response the patients get, 90% of the patients become alright. So now in India, depending upon the availability, the affordability of the drug, it is given as like amongst the first line agents. In the foreign countries, definitely they now prefer it as the first line agent. So this is about Pemphigus. Two questions that I want to discuss here. In the INICT May 23, they gave an assertion reason type of question with respect to Pemphigus. A patient with flaccid bullae and supravasal acanthalysis. So this is the assertion. Yes, a patient with flaccid bullae and supravasal acanthalysis is going to be Pemphigus. This is a correct assertion. Then they gave a reason, row of tombstone appearance is seen in Pemphigus vulgaris and it is diagnostic. So, row of tombstone is definitely seen in Pemphigus vulgaris, it is definitely diagnostic. So, both assertion and reason are correct here, but is the reason a correct explanation? No. You do get supravasal acanthalysis, but row of tombstone is not because of supravasal acanthalysis. Row of tombstone is because the basal cells will separate from each other but they will remain attached to the basement membrane because that attachment is the hemidesmosomes, they are intact. So they remain attached to the basement membrane but they separate from each other and that is how they look like the row of tombstones. So row of tombstones is not because of supravasal acanthalysis. So the reason is not a correct explanation of the assertion. That is why the correct answer here is option B, that both assertion and reason are true, but reason is not a correct explanation of assertion. For a detailed explanation, you can refer to the INI uh, CET recall, which is on YouTube, Dermatology Recall. There I have given a very detailed explanation of this question. It will be easier to understand. So this was actually a question which was testing your concepts. It was testing whether you know that the desmosome joins these two cells and the hemidesmosome joins it to the basement membrane. So this is actually a very typical AIMS question which is testing whether you have studied Pemphigus or you have just done the MCQs, right?
the ne next question on uh, pemphigus was in NEET PG 21. A 30 year old patient came with flaccid bulle which rupture easily on touch. The biopsy from the lesion is shown below. What is the diagnosis? So please tell me here what is the diagnosis? What is the answer to this question? So tell me what is the answer to this question what do you see in the histopath here it is the histopath image which will actually tell you what is the diagnosis so the histopath will tell you what is the diagnosis here very good it is a supra basal acantholysis that you see here the split is just above the basal layer and you also wishful thinking you see the row of tombstone appearance also so the correct answer here is pemphigus vulgaris with this we finish our discussion i hope this makes pemphigus clearer to you we will you know subsequently do more of these clinical surgeries in dermatology where i'll be telling you these clinical cases it's always much easier to understand once you see it as a patient rather than read those two pages from the theory book now that you have seen the patient i hope you will remember the clinical scenario the test and the investigations much better any doubts you can put them in the comments or in the telegram group all the best and study hard good night everyone <coughs>